Muchas gracias, uh, Pepe, por la invitación y muchas gracias a ustedes. Uh, no voy a dar esta charla en español. <laughs> um, my English is definitely a little bit better than my Spanish, so I'll speak slowly. Um, but you probably speak, you probably all speak English better than I do. <laughs> all right, so um, my, uh, my research interests are pretty broad. Um, in my lab, we have been working for uh, 30 years now in Venezuela on a small parrot, the green rumped parrotlet, Porpus passerinus. It started as a little side project something I would do with my free time when I was a postdoc doing research in Venezuela. And um, it took a life of its own, just kept going. Now we've been working long term with good population dynamics, information, behavior. Uh, and uh, Carl Berg, who's worked with me for years, has been filming recently in the nest boxes to learn how parrots learn to talk. And uh, it's been a great, great system to investigate a lot of things. Um, I've been interested for a long time in avian parental care strategies. And it started with the Forpus in, in Venezuela because they lay a large clutch, seven, eight eggs, and they start with first egg incubation. So it can be two weeks, two and a half weeks between hatching of first and last chicks in these nests. Extreme asynchrony. And that led us to a variety of kinds of experiments and asking questions about microbes and climate conditions that allow those eggs or don't allow eggs to persist, the shelf life of eggs. A lot of my work is also about threatened and endangered species and their management. This is a marbled murrelet, a strange seabird. It nests in old growth forests along the Pacific coast of the U.S., not on cliffs or offshore islands like most seabirds. It nests in big old redwood trees, wide limbs, doesn't even make a nest, makes a, plat a sort of depression in the moss and lays its single egg. Very unusual life history, but had major problems with deforestation, loss of the old growth redwoods, and also loss of its food. And then um, for the last uh, decade or so, we've been studying secretive water birds, rails. This is the black rail. Um, it's the smallest rail, perhaps, in the world. And um, it, we never see it. It lives entirely underneath the wetland vegetation. But we go to about 250 wetland sites every year and do uh, call playback surveys to get colonization and extinction rates at these wetlands because it's a nice metapopulation. So we've learned a lot about the rails without ever seeing them. Um, but today I thought I'd talk to you a bit about uh, one of the other long-term projects in my lab, uh, the Grinnell Resurvey Project. And that work is about climate change and land use change and its impacts on vertebrates in California. We're from, probably most of you are familiar with this review paper that Camille Parmesan published uh, more than a decade ago. And it laid out sort of five general things that climate change was doing, most of which seem to be true. So phenological changes in relation to changing weather and climate conditions can lead to mismatched timing, species of predator and prey getting out of synchrony, flowering plants and their pollinators. Um, some of that may resynchronize as climate changes, but we've seen poleward shifts of species in both directions and expansion of disease, tropical diseases moving north. The fifth. The fifth thing from this was they talked about wholesale extinction of species due to climate change. Um, and 
that's not something that we've really seen yet, in all honesty. The best examples in that paper were amphibians in Costa Rica, in the mountaintops there, and their disappearance. And that turned out to be one of the many species that have been affected by the chytrid fungus that has influenced uh, the dynamics of most amphibian populations. So our evidence for real loss of species to climate change is so far mainly in models. Really, if you look at it, it's, I mean, we know that some species are retracting, but I know it's hard to, to say that we've lost whole species yet. And that's partly because species through evolutionary time have done all kinds of things besides go extinct. Yes, when we look at the fossil record, we can see plants and animals that give us examples of extinction, for sure. But we also have seen others that have changed their movements, that have migrated to better habitat, changed their range. Some have stayed in the same range but shifted to use a different habitat. And then others have just tolerated the change, adapted to it. So we, we're going to have evidence of a lot of these things probably happening before our eyes in the next uh, 30 to 50 years. And it's going to be interesting to play out to see which species are capable of responding in what ways. One way that I think we can get a better handle on this besides just using models of species distributions to project in the future is to resurvey and look at the changes that have already taken place and to go back and use old information to do that. And that's what we've been doing in the Grinnell Resurvey Project. We are fortunate at Berkeley to have a museum that was set up by and endowed by a, a heiress. Annie Alexander in the early 1900s who was interested in natural history. She gave the money to create this museum and she picked Joseph Grinnell to be its first director. We don't let people who endow our universities do that anymore. We'll take their money, <laughs> but we won't let them choose who, who becomes the directors. But she was um, really a very interesting woman in her own right, um, very interested in natural history. She chose Grinnell. Grinnell turned out to have a lot of vision and interest and boundless energy. And this was his vision about a museum. Uh, this quote hung on the wall for a long time outside of our library. And it says, at this point, I wish to emphasize what I believe will be the greatest purpose of our museum. The value that might not be realized until the lapse of many years, maybe a century, assuming the material that they collected was preserved. And that is that the student of the future will have access to the original faunal record of California and the West, wherever they work now. This is 1910. Grinnell is already realizing that things are changing. And while he's building a museum through collecting specimens, he also is realizing he's kind of making a biological survey. And so, in fact, wherever they worked, well, in fact, we're the student of the future. Here we are. A hundred years later, we decided to retrace his footsteps as part of a centennial project for the museum. And um, wherever they worked, they worked all over. These are uh, dots indicate where specimens were collected. The rectangles are transects that Grinnell surveyed because he was interested in the idea of an ecological niche and how climate might shape that. You've probably heard of the Grinnellian niche. This is that Grinnell. And um, he had boundless energy. Not only did they collect birds, mammals, and um, herps, but they, they collected information in field notes. They kept field notebooks. He had a method that he wanted his students to collect this information. 
And so those field notebooks tell us how many traps they had out, what they caught every night when they were trapping mammals. Sometimes they would tell us how many birds they saw or what species. Um, and the field notes contain much more information than just the specimens. We've been able to use all of that information as part of the Grinnell resurvey. How did he do this stuff? Well, I think you might find this interesting to hear. Grinnell and I went and I did all the driving. It's him talking. And we never traveled one inch. But he had that notebook open in Rango's. The whole time, he was taking the bird census wherever, wherever we went. That's Grinnell. And uh, we'd be sitting in camp, and we'd both be skinning. Pretty soon he'd throw a rat over to me. He'd say, here, Russell, finish this one up. And he'd, he'd just throw me the skin and pick up his notebook and start writing. And he said over and over, he he said, put it all down. You may not think it's important, but somebody may. And we were that somebody. <laughs> and um, the cool thing is that we've been able to go back to so many places um, that are in those notebooks. And that's what the Grinnell Resurvey Project has been. We started with the sort of low-hanging fruit going to the Sierra Nevada and Yosemite, starting from the Central Valley up over the Sierras repeating that in the southern part of the Sierras and also in the northern part. We've resurveyed those for birds and mammals. We've resurveyed a lot of the coastal areas for birds. And uh, our next step now is we're starting in the desert resurveys this year in Mojave, Death Valley, and Joshua Tree, where climate change is probably pretty important since life is always on the edge in the desert. So um, this work that I'll talk about has had a lot of collaborators, but the main folks involved today from the Mammal End, um, Craig Moritz, who was director of the museum. He is now uh, back in his native Australia. Jim Patton and Chris Conroy, who are um, uh, Jim's uh, curator emeritus and Chris is curator of mammals. Kevin Rowe was also involved in the mammal work and then um, as a, as a postdoc, and Morgan Tingley did his PhD with me, and Peter Panchin, who was a postdoc in my lab. And what we do is we go to places where they surveyed, and we retrap mammals using live traps as a way to get them now. Um, we count birds doing point count transect surveys along two kilometer routes. Grinnell used museum specials. They collected those, for the most part, what they caught. So they removed them um, in terms of the mammals. But their bird counts you know, might have been similar. Sometimes they told us how many they saw, exactly where they went. Sometimes they'd say, today we saw these species. Sometimes they'd say, today we saw these species we didn't see yesterday. And we could use all three kinds of information in now what are becoming well-accepted statistical techniques of occupancy modeling. And they often left us a photographic record so that we could go back to where they camped. That was their, their sort of central place. They camped somewhere for four or five days and set out their traps and collect their birds. Sometimes we could even find the same rock. Some things haven't changed, but other things have changed a lot. In California, we've had a lot of climate change. Um, and it's very lumpy. I think when you look around in many places, you'll find that you know, global climate change, when it scales down locally, there's places that have warmed a lot and some places that have even cooled. There's places that have gotten um, wetter and some that have dried. And these things feed back through things like uh, actual evapotranspiration or climate water deficit, an indicator of stress for plants, in different kinds of ways to affect habitats and the physiological conditions that species find themselves in. Where we started in Yosemite National Park, starting here from the Central Valley 
going up over 3,000 uh, meters, almost 4,000 meters up into the alpine zone. Climate's changed quite a bit. We've had a three to four C increase in minimum temperatures, minimum monthly temperatures over that time. That's where the biggest changes have been. Maximum temperatures haven't changed as much, but minimum temperatures have really risen in a lot of places. And, um, and, and it's often being reflected. We expected that warmth would push species upward. So think about the elevational range of a species in Grinnell's time, the historic era, that was found in the mid and low elevations. With warming, we expected the upper part of its range to move upward. We don't know if it would get so warm that the lower part would contract, possibly. If a species was inhabiting the mid to upper elevations, we expected the lower part of its range to move upward. I don't know whether we could get enough climate change to push it off the mountain, but um, this was, these were the a priori hypotheses that we then began with. And we would then go out, resurvey, and use occupancy models to correct for differences in detection, recognizing if, in fact, Grinnell didn't see it and didn't mean it wasn't there, or if we didn't get it, didn't mean it wasn't there. And so these models assume that re through repeated surveys over a short time period that we can get an estimate of the probability of detection. And we can correct for um, differences, we call them error, between Grinnell's time and now. Uh, differences by observer or time of year or trapping effort. Um, we can look at all the additive factors and their interactions. So in the end, we wind up with a big model set. And we take those candidate models and we look at their influences on op changes in occupancy. And we can model average across them. Let me show you what that looks like. Here's three examples um, from our work in Yosemite. So the alpine chipmunk, all these shaded, these are places that we had Grinnell had sampled. These are places where we went back to and resampled. Um, the gray indicates that nothing was captured there. The black indicates at least one capture of a species there. And you can see in this case, we had a couple of sites down here at about 2,300 meters above sea level that were now absent as well as, well as some others. And the range has retracted upward 625 meters in elevation. We can test a probability of false absence, which is our probability of detection at the site level, accumulated across the set of sites. And in this case, our probability that they were absent and or present and not detected was less than one in a thousand. So this is what we would do. We had different kinds of um, Examples. Sometimes we have, oh, I'm sorry, and then these curves represent the model average change in occupancy over elevation, the probability of a site being occupied uh, historically and now in the current, from our current resurveys. And you can see this species has shifted its range upward. Here's one that also had a shift upward, but it also had some individuals come over from the east side of the Sierras and colonize around, which we discovered through mitochondrial DNA, uh, a different clade that had come all the way up here and colonized the, the top areas. And then likewise, we can see some that have had collapse. Here's a species that is an upper elevation species, the wood rat, but it's gone from both the top and the bottom. So we could see all kinds of patterns. And when we looked at them across 28 mammal species that we had good data for in Yosemite, um, we then aligned species by those that show range expansions, more than 10% of their range uh, we considered significant. So these are green, 
or range contractions in red between the historic and our current, current timeline, or species that had no significant change at all. And you can see a couple of interesting patterns. One is about half the species were showing range change. And those that expanded were mostly low to mid elevation species moving up. Those that contracted were mostly the bottom or lower elevational limits of mid to high elevation species. But there was a lot of, so that's nice, that's what we predicted. It was a simple answer. That's why it could get published in science. Um, I'm here today to tell you the rest of the story. <laughs> it's not so simple. When you start looking at individual species and you start looking at genera, you can see, well, the same genera, for example, Tamias, can have a, a couple of species that are contracting and others showing no change in the same region. Or you can have Microtus that had a species expanding, a species that lost or contracted, and other species showing no change. Same area. Um, when we looked at the birds, it got more complicated. Now, now uh, Morgan Tingley's work, in addition to surveying, oops, in addition to surveying in, in Yosemite, here, he surveys in the northern Sierras, spends two more years doing that, and two more years down here in the southern Sierras in resurveying there. And we see a lot of spatial variation. So these are lower limits, the lower range limits, either moving up or moving down or not changing. And then these are the upper range limits doing the same, moving up, moving down or not changing. And you can see only in a couple places do we have significant differences in the proportion of species, the number of species that are making these changes. Some places we're seeing more movement down than up. Several of these places or similar levels and lots of species whose elevation ranges haven't changed. This was confusing. When we looked at the mammals now a little bit more broadly, Here's the Yosemite, that nice cartoon I showed you. Now here's Lassen to the north, Kings Canyon, Southern Sierra. These are all being done in national parks where land use conversion is not, a, not going on, protected lands. Um, none of the 22 species found in all three regions shifted their upper and lower limits the same way. There's a lot of spatial variation going on. Um, and this had us scratching our heads until we started looking at the climate change. The climate change really differed across these areas. So here we'll look at vectors of change, temperature along this axis, precipitation along this axis between what the conditions were like in the first 30 years of the 1900s and the the most recent 30 years before our surveys. You can see Yosemite here in yellow shows the biggest temperature change along this axis and some precipitation change. Whereas Lassen shows a lot of precipitation change, increase, but very little temperature change. And the Southern Sierras shows some temperature change, but not much precipitation. So what does this mean? Well, if you are on a mountain, as you go up a mountain, it gets cool. So to stay in your same thermal zone, you would need to move up. But as you go up a mountain, it gets rainier, the orthographic effect. So if rainfall has increased over the last 100 years, you'd need to move down to stay in the same precipitation zone. And that's what these vectors show. These are vectors showing how far from a particular site a species would need to move to stay in the same precipitation in blue or temperature in red. Okay, this is elevation along this axis. 
And what I want you to notice is that a lot of the red arrows and the blue arrows are pointing in different directions. Mostly the blue arrows are pointing down, not entirely. Mostly the red arrows are pointing up. So there's a, a something pushing them up and something pulling them down in different directions sometimes. And that's what this squares show here. This is where upslope movement from temperature and downslope movement from precipitation. Most of the time, that was the kind of tension species were facing. Only rarely do we have a downslope movement from temperature and downslope movement from precipitation. So oftentimes things may be being pushed and pulled in different directions from the climate change that's going on. Now, species we do know respond to climatic change. So when we looked at species that have moved and then we tried to attribute were they more likely to move due to temperature or precipitation, we saw some differences as to whether species were in the low part of the mountain area, the mid-elevation species, or the high-elevation species. High-elevation species seem to be responding most frequently to temperature. And that kind of makes sense. I mean, they're often at temperature extremes. Low-elevation species, which frequently aren't at temperature, extremes were responding were better described by responding to precipitation. And those species who were on the mid-range of the slopes, these are birds now, they sort of show a mixed strategy in that way. Very few species actually responded to none of those, were described well by none of those climatic changes. And they tended to be urban species that are widespread, very adaptable. So species are responding to their niche. If we look at our bird data for the Sierra Nevada the, and our mammal data, and then also two other studies that were done, one looking at trees, one looking at butterflies, you can see the taxa are doing different things. Trees actually were moving down. Birds overall don't show a, a change in one direction or the other. Butterflies were moving up. So things are responding, but differently in the same region. Confused? Yeah, I'm confused. Maybe species traits might sort this thing out, you know? Um, we're in the midst of a, a review on this. Um, my PhD student, Sarah McLean, has been scouring the literature, doing a formal meta-analysis using effect sizes, sample sizes, and other things. Um, and each of these indicates a study of multiple species. And you can see that there's not a clear picture of a support or non-support for some of these general kinds of traits predicting range shifts. What does it mean at the community level? Morgan Tingley asked this question. Um, we expected the biggest turnover of species to take place in the mid elevation areas because that's where the high elevation species and the low elevation species would join together. And so we expect biggest turnover there with range changes. But when we corrected for detection, turnover was actually as big at the upper ends as or even bigger than they were in the middle. So we're not really clear what's going to be going on with these reshuffling of communities. So, and that brings me to sort of the, some new things now that we've been working on, um, trying to understand what's going on at the community level a little bit more by amalgamating species responses. Here we are using the coastal bird resurveys and we went to 70 sites um, from central and northern California. And there's a variety of precipitation, temperature, and land use intensity change that have taken place here. By land use intensity, I mean mainly how much development and habitat change has happened around this site. It's hard to get, it's sort of like a human footprint. 
we don't really have good habitat information yet for these places in the early 1900s. But we have a measure now of what you can see of land use intensity. All right. And um, that's what we use to try and get at these things. And again, we use occupancy modeling approaches. This time, we fit our, to try and get a probability that a site is occupied during the historic Grinnell era. And then we get a probability that it remains occupied. Now, one minus the extinction rate. Plus the probability that an unoccupied site, one minus psi, gets colonized. And then what we do is we fit these relationships to our detection histories of presence, absence, presence or absence through resurveys, initial surveys and, and resurveys here, and try and fit this likelihood expression that accounts for de detections and undetections and occupieds and not occupieds to the detection history. That's the machinery that the occupancy modeling does for us. What we're really interested in is covariates that we fit to extinction and to colonization to try and understand what the slope of those relationships might be. Okay, so here's 100 bird species from that reef survey. And here's the change in occupancy. Some of them increased in occupancy. More of them declined in occupancy. <clears throat> and quite a few of them didn't change very much in occupancy, less than 5% between Grinnell's time and now. So about twice as many species declined um, in occupancy as increased. Here are the sort of slopes for each of the species in relation to temperature change, precipitation change, or our land use intensity. These are colonization. These are extinction values. So what you can see with temperature is there's um, actually a, a bit of a positive relationship between temperature <coughs> and colonization, but also um, with extinction. And likewise with precipitation, it's a bit more variable here, but a strong effect. Precipitation seems to influence colonization very strongly compared to this little bit weaker value, but um, weak value on extinction. And then land use change, um, it's kind of all over. Some things are very positively affected, others negatively affected. Extinction, however, is much more likely to occur with land use intensification. So this is good. If you look at these, they're kind of squint a little, they're kind of normally distributed. A lot of the meta-community expectations for change now depend upon some sort of normal expectation across a, a variety of species. Um, this is sort of a check to see what kind of consistency we have. The slopes of um, colonization versus the slopes of extinction. We would expect them to be net kind of negatively related. Species that were um, positively affected <clears throat> or whose slope for temperature was, was positive for extinction should be negative for colonization and so forth. And you can see that works for temperature, kind of works for land use intensity, but not so good for precipitation. Precipitation seems to be the wild card as to how that's going to be affecting species. And then here I tried to look at um, what happens with one particular climate change scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, a one degree increase in mean average temperature and 100 millimeters of drying. How does that affect species? Some species are going to benefit from that, but a lot of species will actually lose from both. 
which is kind of interesting. So these are the ones who are losing in occupancy, change in occupancy from climate, change in occupancy from land use, negative or positive. Um, species are going to be responding very differently to these kinds of things. And it's probably going to be the ones that are looking to be declining from both kinds of effects that we're going to need to be worrying about in the future. So what does that mean when you think about the whole meta community? What's that mean for diversity? Let's go back to these 70 sites, now get an average probability of colonization at a site, average probability of extinction. Let's see how that relates to temperature, precipitation change, latitude, longitude, altitude, distance from the ocean. Throw them all into multiple regression. Let's see what comes out. Extinction risk seems to be highly related to temperature change. All right. On the more temperature change, the more extinction risk. And also related to latitude. I'll show you the relationships in a minute. Colonization shows no particular response. Can't predict very well what's going to happen at a site in relation to uh, the colonization. Turnover, colonization plus extinction, again, pretty strongly related to temperature, but also some effects of latitude and elevation here. So what do these relationships look like? Here's turnover, colonization plus extinction, and yeah, a lot of variation, but some semblance of a relationship here. Latitude, our study area wasn't over a very large latitude, um, so perhaps this is why the, the slope is not as strong, but some evidence of a latitude effect. What does it mean if we put them together? What does it kind of mean for diversity? So this is the level of change in temperature that we saw in our study. This is the level that some models are predicting in the future. So extinction was positively related to temperature change. As temperature increases, the rate of extinction increases. Colonization is flatlined. No relationship there. So as this level uh, changes and increases, we would expect turnover to increase more. And we would expect species richness to decline. So that's what we're sort of looking at using those kinds of slopes to try and integrate. What we would expect to see then would just be a slow decline perhaps in species richness. Unless something changes with colonization over time to keep up with the extinction, local extinction that's taking place. It's not global extinction, but it's kind of local extinction, which adds up. Okay, so let me just end with a couple of concluding remarks. And this is how we mostly think about trying to understand climate change. We take a distribution of a species, we feed it into a species distribution model, we grab temperature, we grab uh, precipitation and other factors, and then we push those envelopes out to the future and map what it's going to look like. Um, pretty hard to actually validate those models. Our own work with the Grinnell resurvey has found sort of pretty mixed ability when we gave Joseph Grinnell a computer and climate surfaces being able to predict how things would look now. I argue that actually the path to understanding future climate change is going back and looking at what information we already have historically to think about measures of change that have taken place. And there's been a lot of change. The challenge is attribution. It's not easy. We took a very simple pathway to this in the work we've done up to now. Um, we're going to try and do better in the desert where our resurveys will develop physiological models to try and predict physiological factors that are relating to extinction. We have better opportunity to tie directly into land use change, fire change, 
invasion by exotic species. Um, and then the sort of last frontier of species interactions. That's a tough one, but one that we think is probably very important to try and get at. That's where we see thinking about the future is actually getting a better handle on the change that's already taken place and recognizing that pretty much we've been able to do this work because of the material that Grinnell had saved. Now, this may sound a little depressing, but um, someday your data will be historic. Some of us, that day is coming sooner than others. But um, by that I mean your work is taking place at a time of large change. But frequently we publish our work, but we don't have a place to conserve our data. That, that data that we're using now, we couldn't be doing the work that we're doing if we didn't have access to the original data to go back and recompile night by night, day by day, sampling information. And that's the level of information someone's going to need from your study, the actual data, not the published results, because methods of analyses are going to change for the better probably. Um, and your work will have an opportunity to contribute to that. So think about some way that you're going to preserve that for the future. Thanks very much. <laughs>